then uh, bear with me as um, technology is not my jam, but we're going to get the slideshow going before we introduce Mike. All right. So as you know, you're here at Creative Mornings. If you do not know that you are at a Creative Mornings event, I don't know how to help you there. It's <laughs> super clear. Um, and then additionally, if you aren't already following us on all of our social media channels, I encourage you to go ahead and do that. That's where all of the information about our events will be located moving forward. Um, as something that we talked about every event last year, so you, if you don't know, we launched our chapter of Creative Mornings in February of 2020. Um, on February 29th, actually on leap year and uh, the world, you know, kind of took a nosedive right after that. So we haven't been able to meet in person since then. Um, it's been a bit discouraging to like consistently be virtual considering like our town is mostly vaccinated and we have masks and opportunities to do other things in person. But our global organization just isn't quite comfortable um, having us launch in person events yet. So we're going to reevaluate in August and hopefully sometime August, September, October, we can be in person again, um, which, you know, we'll be at a local venue somewhere in town we'll have coffee donuts and um, it'll be great to see everyone in person again but until then just follow us here and you'll get all the latest updates um, a couple of global sponsors so if you aren't familiar with creative mornings um, these events are always free we will never charge for you to attend these it's, this is to make it um, as accessible as possible to all communities but we do have some global sponsors that just help keep these um, or this organization alive and one of those is mailchimp so mailchimp is our global marketing sponsor um, they've got a couple of new deals going on um, for freelancers, so I will send out all this information after the meeting, um, but if you're ever interested in, in indulging in some of the promotions that they offer to Creative Mornings, um, all that information will be in your inbox soon. Um, our other global sponsor is Skillshare. Um, if you haven't had an opportunity to check out Skillshare, I encourage you to do so. Um, you can see here they offer like training and learning opportunities. It's like an online learning library. It's like a, a million different things. And as you can see here, I mean, you can check out watercolor, photography, um, learning how to grow your own food. And so it's just very, very cool. Um, it's very similar to some of the field trips that um, Creative Mornings offers, but these just always exist online from a variety of folks all over the world. Um, and I did mention field trips. So field trips is um, something that we used to do like in each, each city. So like Columbia, for example, could have a field trip to the Blue Note where we learn more about how um, the, the organization works and how people are booked and we get to see behind the scenes. So it's just like a behind the curtain peek at a particular um, organization or practice but since we're all virtual the opportunity to attend virtual field trips has been very cool because you get to see behind the scenes of what someone is doing in New York what someone's doing in Chicago and abroad I know that Sarah has been a very uh, very sweet proponent of this and has been attending a lot of these um, so if you're interested these always exist online as well and they're always free so you can attend live or you can go back and watch the recording later but it's a very cool opportunity yeah, I just will plug field trips really quick. They, I probably, Lindsay's saying that because I literally have like one or two of those events on my calendar every week. And it's, I've never been disappointed. I walk away meeting new people all the time. It's a great place to network. It's also just a really good place to learn new um, skills or see different things. So if you do have an opportunity to attend any of them, look at that calendar and book some things because it's really great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and as, as always, we like to um, recite the Creative Mornings Manifesto before each event, just as a reminder of who we are and what we stand for. Um, so I've asked one of our team members to read the manifesto aloud for us before we move on to the theme and we introduce our speaker. Morning, everyone. Everyone is creative. A creative life requires bravery and action, honesty and hard work. We are here to support you, celebrate with you, and encourage you to make the things you love. We believe in the power of community. We believe in giving a damn. We believe in face-to-face -face connections and learning from each other in jazz hands, virtual claps, and virtual snaps. We bring together people who are driven by passion and purpose, confident that they will inspire one another and inspire change in, the na in neighborhoods and cities around the world. Everyone is welcome. Thanks, Diamond. Um, so this month's theme is resilient, which makes a lot of sense given the last 14 months that we've all lived through. I don't know about you, but I'm really looking forward to like getting to like 2023 when this is like so far in the rear view, we stop talking about it. Like it's just like something we consistently discuss, but we're also coming out of, you know, a global pandemic. 
Um, so resilience seems like an appropriate theme for this month in particular, um, given the speaker that we have with us. Um, as a reminder, all of our themes are chosen by one of the Creative Mornings chapters. This one was chosen by the Dallas chapter and was illustrated by Nikki Duck. Nikki Dion. Um, if you're interested in learning more about that, it's on our Instagram. You can check more of her work out. Um, uh, before we introduce this, or have Sarah introduce the speaker, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to send those questions directly to Lauren here in our, in our group. You can DM those to her throughout and she'll collect those and we'll go through a Q&A at the end. Um, but then if you think of a question in the moment later on, that's okay too, but um, you can feel free to send those to her. Um, so without any further ado, um, Sarah, if you would just introduce our, our speaker for this month and then we'll, we'll head on from there. Sure. So I am really excited um, to hear from our speaker, Mike, this morning. Um, you know, when we first learned about the theme, I think, you know, I've only been on the speaker team for a little bit for a few months, but usually when these angles get released or we hear about the new theme, there's a lot of deliberation. There's a lot of thinking about how we could like tie in different angles and we're really lucky to live in this community because we have so many people that we can, you know, that always we find ways to kind of tie things to. But this was one of the quicker decisions that I think that we've made thus far that I've been involved in. Um, as Lindsay mentioned, you know, when we hear about uh, the theme of resiliency, um, you know, it means really just the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties um, and essentially toughness. And I think obviously as lindsay mentioned too we've all we've all felt a little bit of that at some point i think over the last year we've had to be resilient um but when we really think about um you know the live music industry in general um you know that was one thing that just kind of immediately popped into our brains of being a great a great thing to highlight we know that the performers themselves at those live music venues are creative like everyone is creative that's what we say and believe in creative mornings but it's obvious when we see those performers on stage they're just like showcasing their creativity to the world um what we don't typically see or hear a lot of is all of the creative and hard work that really goes on behind the scenes at these live music venues to either go as smoothly as we're hoping them to or at least feel as smoothly as possible for all of the attendees um, and the performers so we're thinking about the community um, and examples of resiliency, Mike, um, and honestly, just his leadership at both of the music venues in our town came to mind pretty quickly. So um, just a really quick anecdote before we bring Mike up to share this with us. Um, the very first event that I actually attended after many moons of being holed up in my house, like a lot of other people, um, was actually to a live outdoor show at Rose last November. Um, I was a little nervous to go. I think everyone that probably was there was because we weren't sure what was going to be there. I think we all trust in our community and trust um, in the venues themselves because they've done great work up to this point, but it was a pandemic. It was scary. Um, but I think as soon as we walked in there and honestly saw, I mean, they had signs going in certain directions. The bar was set up really well for people to kind of come and go. Tables were set up. Um, and it was just so wonderful, number one, to feel safe, but number two, just to get live music and to be able to be at a show and see friends either upstage or from afar at different pods. And that was I, kind of what I went back to when thinking about this theme. And that's why we kind of immediately thought of Mike. Um, so I'm excited to bring Mike up um, and share with us. Mike, if you want to if you want to do a screen share and share your screen, unless Lindsay, you already have his presentation. I wasn't sure. Uh, nope, I will share my screen. Hopefully this goes well. Uh, let's do this one. So can you see my, my PowerPoint? Yep. Cool. I haven't made one of these since like 2007. Um, so that was that was interesting the other night. Um, it was good so far, Mike. I think if you go to the view at the top of um, the PowerPoint and then click present, there should be like a presenter way to do it, and then you can kind of run through it. Can you see all the slides at the bottom, or are you just seeing the big yep green slide? We can, but that's okay. We don't mind. Oh. Um, cool. I wonder. I just had this working a second ago. Sorry, now it's now it's going to trigger my OCD. I got to figure this out. <laughs> How about now? Are you seeing the full screen slide? Yeah, perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, yeah, a little background about me. I'll be, I'm assuming uh, a lot of you read that bio that I that I crafted, but uh, from St. Louis originally. 
I moved to Columbia in 2007 to go to Mizzou and uh, quickly realized that college wasn't for me after uh, like five years of wasting my and my mother's money and changing majors like four times. Uh, I dropped out and I got an internship at the Blue Note. Um, prior to that, what, what kind of led me to, to want to pursue that was I moved in with some hippies and they had a jam band and uh, they would play at Mojo's all the time and uh which is now rose music hall and and so i just love going to their shows i would help them load in and i just like really loved like the whole behind the scenes which even at that point like there wasn't like a ton behind the scenes i just thought it was cool to be there before the rest of the people and uh see sound checks and, and everything else um and then drink their free beer and not have to pay for a ticket so that was cool too um and then yeah so then got an internship at the blue note and uh and, and the rest is pretty much history. Worked my way to a bartender and assistant manager position and then general manager and now venue director. Um, a little bit of background on our company too, uh, as I think a lot of people are familiar. Richard King started the Blue Note back in 1980, 80 or 81, I think 80. Um, so we've been around for a hot minute. Um, in 2014, um, Richard sold the Blue Note and Rose to uh, Matt Gerding and Scott Leslie who were based in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, Matt Gerding was actually born and raised in Columbia, um, went to school at Mizzou um, and, and was a Columbia native. And he grew up kind of going to the Blue Note and, and knew it well and knew, you know, our brand and what we meant to the community. So that, so that was good. You know, it was a hard, hard transition for a lot of reasons, but having uh, somebody like that involved kind of gave us all a peace of mind to know that, um, you know, we still had roots firmly planted in town. Um, then in 2017, we ended up merging with another company uh, that it was also based in Madison, Wisconsin, that mostly handled um, like national touring business. They didn't actually own or operate any venues. Um, they just they just booked tours all over the country. Um, they booked Metallica tours, Red Hot Chili Peppers tours, uh, Brantley Gilbert, uh, some some really big name acts. Um, you know, in in thirty cities across the country. So it was a cool partnership because then we went from, you know, this. Uh, uh, just running small clubs and venues and theaters to kind of doing it all from, you know, Rose Music's, uh, Rose Music Hall size all the way up to, you know, putting, putting, you know, huge acts in the Sprint Center in Kansas City. So, um, so it's cool. We, we run the gambit of what you can do with live music. Um, so anyway, some of my anecdotes throughout this presentation um, are not just relatable uh, are pertinent to like, you know, Columbia, but also just our company at large in, in our other markets. So, I did my best to focus on Columbia, but some of it, some of it involves other people in other places. So um, anyways, uh, we'll jump right in. Uh, for those of you that don't know, last year was our, uh, our 40th anniversary. So yeah, quick math, 1980 is when Richard opened the Blue Note. Um, so we weren't able to really celebrate our 40th anniversary. Um, so we're hoping that we can do something cool um, this year at some point when, when uh, we're, we're running full speed again. So um, when I was putting this together, I initially penciled out uh, like um, there we go. I initially penciled out um, like a timeline from like March until now, and I kind of ran through it, and it was so boring and it was like so painful because everybody knows what happened. Um, like I don't need to tell you when the pandemic hit and and you know how it affected us. It's pretty obvious. Um, so, anyways, I kind of pivoted and decided that I would just cover. Um, some broader topics um, that I think, you know, we and our company showed resiliency in. Um, so hopefully it's a little bit more engaging. Uh, I'll do my best not to, to drone on. So chime in at any point if I'm, if I'm being boring. Um, so the topics I'm going to hit are uh, artists and booking, um, general operations, our team, our fans, Creative ideas, and I also need to couple this with just marketing in general. Um, it was it was late Wednesday night when I was doing this, and I, I left that out. Um, so I'll hit creative ideas and marketing, um, and then our future um, now that we're getting out of the pandemic. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, artists and booking. Um, so yeah, pandemic comes, and we immediately have to cancel, postpone, reschedule everything on the calendar. Um, <clears throat> and the reason I put all of those words there is because there is a difference between all of them, especially as it relates to um, having to offer refunds to customers. So if a show is straight up canceled, we are legally obligated to offer a refund to anybody that asks for it. Um, if a show is postponed, um, we 
not that we don't have to, but we're not obligated to offer a refund until we end up with a rescheduled date. And then once you have a rescheduled date, um, you can, uh, there's like a, a window for the customer to obtain a refund if they're unable to attend the new date. So there was a lot of uh, things in work there because, you know, we, we certainly want to customers to have their money back if, they're, if we cancel a show, but we also can't just empty our bank accounts to everybody and then have no operating income. So it was, it was a weird, weird waters to navigate there with uh, how we handled certain shows. And especially at the beginning when um, nobody really knew how long it was going to last. Um, so that's uh, kind of my next point when talking to our talent buyers and our uh, leaders in the company, you'd hear things like, uh, yeah, we're going to press pause for a couple weeks. Um, so we'd take these shows in, in March and April and kick them down the road to May, which was easier to do with the, the local and regional programming. Um, the national acts, obviously, it's a little bit more complicated to just find a home for them six weeks later. Um, but anyways, we just start kicking as much stuff, you know, down the road as we can. Uh, then it becomes obvious that uh, it's going to be a little longer. So uh, the theme changed too. I think the summer, late summer is looking good. You know, let's move some of this stuff to July, August. We'll definitely be able to play it out then. Um, and then it went to, I'm really hopeful for a killer fall. We're putting all these tours into September and October and we're going to, we're going to have a bang and fall. We're going to make up for all this lack, you know, the, the lack of business. And, uh, and then that went to, we're fucked. Um, and uh, we, it was, just, it was, yeah, it was crazy. We we rescheduled the same show, I mean, five, four or five times on some of these acts. Some of them are still in technically in postponement status. Like some of them we haven't even have found homes for yet because, you know, they're, they're going to redo the tour. We just don't know when it's going to be and, and where it's going to land. So, um, so that was interesting to say the least. Um, now things are, are a lot better. I mean, we obviously have more clarity with restrictions lifting. We have sort of a penciled out plan of what uh, what we're going to be doing and, and what we're going to be allowing over the next couple months. So, um, you know, in terms of the talent buying side of things, I think we, uh, I think we're, we're almost, you know, out of the tunnel. So, um, so that's good. But, um, throughout all that, we, uh, we came up with a plan, um, to, to open in, in June, once the city allowed us to do, to do small scale events again. So, um, so then it's like May, June, and we're like, okay, the big stuff is going away or some of this stuff, maybe we can play it into a, a you know, a, a smaller capacity and, and the bands will be cool with taking a smaller payout. Um, but anyways, so we're, we, we have the plan in June 19th to reopen. Um, so then it goes into who do we book? Um, who's available, who wants to play, who thinks it's safe to play. Like, you know, bands, a lot of bands didn't want, any of their shows tied to the, you know, potential negative stigma of, of having a concert during the pandemic. Um, so it was kind of hard to navigate, like who was even a, a potential candidate to book. Um, and then we got into, you know, what kind of genres do we book? I mean, before we would book anybody and everything. And now it's like, well, we can't really have a heavy metal show. I mean, A, like nobody wants to sit down at that. And B, we can't have gatherings and mosh pits and people sweating on each other. And um, so, okay, we do we book all stuff that's, you know, folksy and bluesy and people can sit down for. Um, you know, we, we really wanted to go away from the idea of having like a rock show, especially for the plans we were presenting to the city. Um, and and so yeah then we're asking people to do stripped down sets and then people are asking about you know having openers and and then we had to think about all that stuff from an operational perspective of do we have enough room on stage are they bringing their own gear is it even safe to you know attempt to do multiple bands in the same night um, if they're okay with it that's fine but like you know we know they're not in the same household unit so like where is our uh, you know, where's our moral compass and all that. Um, so, so that was tough too. We ended up landing on just usually doing evenings with or, or single band bills, um, with a couple exceptions here and there. Um, and then timing was, it was all on that mess of planning too, because, you know, with outdoor shows, we have noise curfews on the front and back end, uh, of shows that we're working with. So, you know, then it was all about fitting it into the small window of, of time that we had. So, um, so that was, that was not fun, uh, to say the least. Uh, then the other thing too that we had to think about artists is, is you know, keeping them safe. We the only exposure that we had that I know of in our company was was a band that came through and, and two days after they played, um, they turned up 
two of the members turned up positive tests. So we had to quarantine a couple of our employees for a few weeks and they lost out on shifts. And then we kind of had to redo our plan of, all right, well, we don't want anyone to lose work and, and we don't want anyone to be exposed or get, you know, get the virus obviously. So then we had to kind of redo the plan of, of keeping artists and our production crew and our management crew separate, which is hard to do, you know, plugging in, you know, amps and, and microphones and sound checking everything. It's, it's hard to do to, to, you know, with distance. So, that was a challenge too, but we, we figured it out. Um, this isn't necessarily something that we did, but I did think it was interesting, all of the like band side hustles that you're seeing online. They were obviously doing live streams. Um, people were uh, selling, you know, handwritten lyrics, uh, obviously all kinds of crazy merch. Um, it was really cool. I saw bands like just doing totally weird. So like one band was doing like leather work selling that from their artist page and other band was like making candles. It was like, they were just doing whatever they could uh, and trying to put their, their brand or their spin on it uh, to just make some, some money in the interim. You know, a lot of these, uh, you know, smaller bands or, you know, mid major bands. I mean, they don't, they don't have money in the bank to weather the storm. Um, so uh, it was, it was tough for them. Um but anyways, and then uh, I just thought this was a fun piece of content to share. This was our calendar in March, and you're going through there, and it's like, okay, we got some shows, and there's True Falls Festival, and uh, a couple more shows, 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th, boom, canceled, rescheduled, 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 moved, get into April, everything is rescheduled, postponed, uh, just a so many shows, and then obviously into the next month. So I love this one, too, on, on May 7th, just dead. It's not even rescheduled. It's not postponed. That one's dead and it's never coming back. So I don't know why Pat, uh, who's our talent buyer, chose to use that language, but I got a kick out of that. Um, so yeah, with the amount of events that we do, it's like big or small. It's just, it all required so much legwork and so much pivoting every day to figure out a way to make them work um, or figure out what to do if they were going away. Um, next up, we have our operations, um, which as... Sarah mentioned, you know, that took a lot of planning to do to, to figure out how to, how to make it safe and, uh, and, you know, not have it be a really shitty experience too for everyone. So, you know, so much planning and prep work. I mean, given the, the size of our company now and, and all the other promoters and venues and everything that we work with, we did have sort of a wide net to cast to, well, you know, I guess you could call it consultation or just brainstorming, but we were talking to a lot of people throughout the country about what their plans were. Um, you know, different areas had tighter restrictions, looser restrictions, figuring out what people were doing based on what was going on in their, uh, within their, you know, particular city. Um, so, so yeah, there was probably, I mean, from April, all of April and all of May, I think the majority of my day was consumed with gathering information and, and trying to figure out how we could turn it into an actionable plan here. Um, so yeah. Oh, and the estimations too, is like everything cost a million dollars. It seemed like, you know, next thing you know, a gallon of sanitizer was 150 bucks and, um, and then we had no cash flow. So it's like, okay, well, we have to buy all this stuff in order to do a 150 person show. That's not really going to put any money in the bank. So it's just this whole, this whole balancing act. And then the whole guidance of like, okay, sanitize everything. Nobody can touch anything to just kidding. It's in the air. Uh, get a quote on your HVAC system and, and just, it was just a never ending barrage of, of new information to try to discern and figure out how it applied to, to us. Um, so that was tough. And then, yeah, the city orders and, and recommendations obviously were ever evolving and, and in all of our markets too. So, um, so yeah, we were, we were taking on a lot of information and, and trying to figure out how to use it. Um, we went through probably, four iterations of our operational plan at Rose before we thought we had something airtight to present to the city. Um, and, uh, and when we did, they had like two things they wanted to see changed or a couple, you know, a couple questions. And other than that, they thought it looked really good. Um, and uh, so, that, so that was promising that, you know, we had kind of checked all the boxes that the health department wanted to see. Um, and then, yeah, just generally speaking, there was changes in every aspect of like the actual, like we're open, uh, people are coming to the venue thing or side of things. We, uh, you know, we're, we're having to do contract tracing at contact tracing at the box office, um, which actually ended up being fairly easy with credit cards because our ticketing system automatically captures your data when, when you swipe a credit card. Um, but, you know, 
keeping everything contactless and cashless as much as we could there. Same with the bar. Um, Sarah mentioned that, you know, we kind of had a kind of a concession style set up rather than bellying up to the bar like everyone was used to. Um, and security changes too. I mean, not, not just like the enforcement that they had to do, but every little thing had to be analyzed and, and figure out if it was safe. Like one of the reasons we went to 21 and up was, was not only just to, you know, maximize the potential revenue from every person coming in the building was it's also because then the security guys didn't have to uh you know scrutinize people's ids and put wristbands on them and stamp them and everything else they didn't have to touch them so um so every little thing you know had, had kind of a, a you know more than one effect and more than one reason why the decision was made um we had to have like five or six different seating maps throughout the time we've we've been open over the last you know 14 months and that's something that was very new for especially rose um, creating pods table arrangements um, all that stuff we went through uh, uh, first when we opened I think it was more of just like please keep your distance here's some tables don't move them they're set here for a reason to okay now we have pods on the ground when you show up we're gonna seat you sort of like a host or a hostess at a restaurant to okay now it's a reserve map where you're purchasing your actual spot ahead of time from a map um so it was pretty much like it felt like every other week i was having another sit down meeting with our managers or our staff to to retrain them on on what the plan was for that week um which that was that was a good thing too everyone was very flexible on our team you know everyone no one was like rolling their eyes or you know getting upset everyone knew that that's just was what we had to do and everyone rolled with the punches so that was great uh and then yeah we had to we had to start and stop things several times i mean we obviously paused in in march and then reopened in june we're smooth sailing there for a few months and then we had to stop again in september that's when um it was recommended that we do like you know actual assigned seating and, and group limitations so we had to pause for a weekend redo all of our plans there um you know we we moved things up to the blue note when it got cold and uh then the cases were spiking in november so we paused there we restarted in february and then moved back to rose in april and so it's just been it's been a whirlwind of stop and go uh over the last 14 months um our team resiliency which this is something that i 100 percent cannot take credit for this all goes to our our leadership and our presidents and the owners of our company um but the music industry like a lot was just decimated by the pandemic nobody had any source of revenue except for maybe some record labels um and and everybody in the industry was was laying off was furloughing was was getting rid of employees i mean i think some of the bigger promoters, I mean, were, were laying off or furloughing like up to like 90% of their staff at times. Um, so it was really scary, especially as that news was rolling in uh, about, you know, like, oh shit, well, I'm sure we're next. Um, but our, our, our leaders came up with a plan. They, they waited things out. They didn't ask, uh, act rashly. And, uh, and we, we operated for about six or seven weeks with no income and still paying everyone full salaries and, and uh, with no reduction. And then once the, the federal uh, unemployment, uh, you know, stimulus bonus, whatever you want to call it, rolled out to supplement the state unemployment, they crafted a way that kept almost every one of our uh, team members fully intact. We saw like very, very minimal pay decreases with this plan to utilize uh, both company money and government money. And at the end of the day, I didn't, I don't think any of us really cared as long as most of what you were expecting hit your bank account. I don't, nobody really cared who it was coming from. Um, so that was great. I mean, for the size of a, the company we are and the lack of revenue that we had, nobody was expecting that. And we were all still are, you know, eternally grateful that they figured out that plan. Um, so yeah, when most of the industry took the easy way out, we, we took the better way. It was, it was difficult and took a lot of planning and it depleted our res, you know, our cash reserves, but it was, it was certainly the better way for, um, all the humans in our company. Um, another thing with our team that was really cool to see was just all of the cross department work and cross market work, which we obviously had a lot of free time, but you know, you had heads of security coming up with plans with the marketing team and, and production people coming up with, you know, plans with the bar people and just everybody, no, you know, there weren't, there weren't really departments. We were all kind of just floating through the ether together and figuring out a way to make it work. And, uh, trying to come up with good ideas. So that was cool to see. And, uh, you know, something that I think, 
you know, those, those sort of like, you know, team bonds, I think is going to for sure last with us, you know, after the pandemic. Um, but yeah, some of these scary headlines that we were seeing, um, yeah, this one from Rolling Stone is music venue shutter former owners described devastating toll list of permanently closed indie clubs nationwide, blah, blah, blah. I think it's up to like 200 venues or so that have shut down because of the pandemic. Um, AEG, which is a giant promoter in the country, um, furloughing staff due to COVID-19, um, reduced hours and salaries as live music events come to a halt. WME, which is a giant agency based in Nashville, um, cuts 20% of, of its workforce just laid off. Uh, or actually, I think those people might have been terminated. Just We don't have room for you in the company anymore. Um, and then this little blurb from an NPR article, um, across the country, music venues remain closed due to the pandemic. And according to a new survey, 90% of independent venue owners, promoters, and bookers say they will have to close permanently within the next few months if they can't get an, inf an infusion of targeted government funding, which by the way, still hasn't happened. Um, the shuttered venue operators grant was finally pushed through all the red tape, the portal for promoters and festival bookers and, and and venues to apply opened up the beginning of April or middle of April. And the day it opened up, it crashed, which was just absolutely infuriating to see that, that like the government that knew exactly how many people were out there that needed this money, uh, didn't have whatever technical means to, to keep the portal up and running. Um, it has since reopened, it reopened a couple of weeks later, all the people that were able to apply, I, I think were able to apply, but there still hasn't been any money sent out. So everyone's still waiting to see if they're going to get any money. And that's the other thing is that there's no indication um, if you are going to qualify, regardless of how big or how small you are. So there's a lot of people um, who are in tough spots right now because of this, this uncertainty. I saw like our, our friends at Roots and Blues, they started a, a 501c3 um, just to, to kind of help bridge the gap between now and, and hopefully some cash infusion that they'll get from the government. So um, just a little plug for them. If anybody's got some extra dough, you should you should donate to them. They 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 certainly need it. Um, what else? Uh, our fans. Um, so they they were all resilient too. Fans, patrons, customers, whatever you're going to call them. Um, they're they're. I was surprised uh, by that. The uh, I, I'm a believer that music is necessary for the soul um, and your your mental health and everything. But um, it was became very clear that um, you know entertainment was still a luxury and uh, and it's not something that you know was deemed necessary uh, by by everyone else and and rightfully so. You know, healthcare workers and grocery stores and infrastructure and all that certainly comes before us. And uh, we quickly were bumped to the bottom of the list. Um, but, we, you know, when we were able to reopen, um, I mean, we, we were sh not shocked, but we were, we were, we love the outpouring of support. You know, people came to so many shows. I saw like people come to like six shows in a row, regardless of the genre. They just wanted to be there. They wanted to hang out. They wanted the atmosphere. They just wanted to hear amplified music in the air. Um, so that was great that, that people stuck with us. Um, throughout our whole planning process, we always were thinking about the people too, you know, as we were coming up with all these rules and regulations and directions and, and yeah, signage and everything. We were like, is this going to suck? Cause if this is going to suck for everyone, we don't want to do it. Um, the, the fan experience is at like sort of the, you know, the core of, of what we do. It's connecting the artists with the fans and, and making sure the fans have a good time. Um, so, um, so yeah, and I don't think it sucked. Uh, and I don't think anyone else thought it sucked, but, but, you know, it was, it was tough. That was, that was the thing we were always weighing. Um, we pretty much deemed if it's, if it's safe and we don't think there's any risks uh, or, or huge risks um, and it's not going to lose us money, it's probably worth it. And, um, and, you know, so there were some shows where we were, you know, maybe putting a couple hundred bucks in the bank at the end of the day, which in any normal circumstance would not be worth it for us to do. Um, but it was in this scenario, it was worth it, worth it to, yeah, bring the experience to our fans to to put people back to work, to put artists back to work, put a little money in their pocket. Um, except obviously when the winter hit uh, in November and cases skyrocketed, and then then it became unsafe, and we didn't want to be a super spreader event for a fifty person show on a Sunday evening at the Blue Note. Um, so uh, we had a pivot there. Um, another thing that I think showed fan um, 
resiliency or, or trust really was that the, the amount of people that wanted refunds for rescheduled shows was very low, um, which was, which was promising to hear, you know, we, we still issued a lot of refunds, but like, I mean, maybe 15%, 20% of like shows that were sold out, we issued refunds to. Um, so that was, that was great to see. I mean, we have a, we have a, a we had a sold out Ninth Street Summerfest show with Cody Jinx booked in 2020 that got bumped a couple of times. And now it's, it's actually going to play out in July. I think we should be announcing it today. Um, but out of 3000 tickets sold, I think we issued like a hundred refunds or something. So um, everybody was like, Nope, I'm holding on to my ticket. I don't need that money back. I want to see the show. Um, so that was really encouraging to see as, as we were rolling through that awful year. Um, creative ideas and marketing. So, uh, the marketing aspect that I left out, um, I'll just touch on because they our marketing team. I mean, obviously we had to pivot operationally and from a talent buying side, but I mean, they're the ones who communicate with the public. They're the ones that field all of the customer questions. They're the ones that have to kind of take everything that's in my brain about an operational plan and package it up nicely and make it make sense. Um, so they did a killer job. I mean, they, they were just put through the ringer um, with, with, you know, every scenario, horrible scenario that you can imagine from a marketing side and, and they did a great job. Um, so hats off to all of them. Um, but yeah, we, we came up with some creative ideas while we were shut down. We all had some time to think about things and brainstorm. Uh, we did a series called social distraction. Um, it was like a, it was going to be a live stream event. Um, we figured out that there was too many, uh, too many technical, technical issues with a live stream. We didn't want to do it inside the blue note for obvious reasons at the start of the pandemic. And then just between somebody not having a good internet connection, bad camera or whatever, um, the live thing wasn't a good idea. So we had everyone pre record it and then we just blasted it out from our, from our pages. So that was a cool thing that we did for a month or two. Uh, we came up with a concert in a box idea. Uh, that one was mine. I'll take the props for that. Uh, we came up with quarantine merch, quarantine specific merch. Um, with, uh, we had a speakeasy wedding idea. That was when the city limitations, I think were 10 people at that point. Um, so that's when we came up with that idea. Um, once the end of the year rolled around, we came up with some Christmas merch and a super hot item, the men of the blue note calendar. Hope everyone picked one of those up. Um, we, we came up with a good pivot for our, our MoFest series and I'll go and I have some pictures and stuff. I'll talk about each of these, but we came up with a cool pivot for our MoFest series. Um, and then we came up with some ideas to do outdoor shows at uh, Midway, the truck stop that we've done shows at years ago. Um, but anyways, this was the art for our social distraction series. I thought it was pretty cool with all the people out on their balconies and I don't know, it was just a cool vibe. I think this happened like right, right around the time when uh, like there was some viral video from like Italy where everyone was like singing on their balconies during the lockdown, which was really cool. And so I felt like that was like, very applicable art to that time, uh, time in our lives. Um, and then we had the concert in a box. Um, this was another cool thing of like cross market collaboration. That bandana design was actually designed by the wife of our venue director in Charleston, South Carolina. So she ended up creating a bandana that we sold in, in Charleston, Columbia and Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and yeah, you got some koozies and a little quarantine postcard and a sticker and some beer and um, yeah, it was a fun little thing. I think we ended up selling like, I don't know, nothing crazy, like 70 or 80 of them, but that was a cool thing to see. We were like, this might be a horrible idea that two people buy into, but um, whether they actually wanted it or they just wanted to show support, a, a good amount of people jumped on it. Um, and then yeah, our quarantine merch, that was the front of the t-shirt with our 40 year anniversary. And then we had this little uh, house tour thing on the back of the shirt with you know 9 12 a.m bathroom and 9 17 kitchen with special guest breakfast and so i thought that was pretty fun um and then yeah this was our ad for the speakeasy weddings um because that was the other thing too i don't i'm sure you guys are aware of this but like everybody who had a wedding planned like they all got canceled too so there was a lot of people that i think just wanted to do it they're like you know what screw it i can't have 100 people but like i want to get married i want to do this um so we we offered this up and we had a couple bites. We ended up actually doing one in the blue note when uh, when restrictions were eased a little bit. I think we did like 40 or 50 people for that one. Um, that was a cool thing. I was glad we were able to help 
you know, help a couple out and actually have their, their special day. Um, and then we were selling the, yeah, the, the Christmas merch. This was a print. Carl Busson actually took this photo. So we printed that out on like big heavy cardstock and a couple different sizes. And that was available for purchase. Uh, there's our men of the blue note calendar with yours truly there on the left. Uh, Mr. June coming up and, uh, uh, then we had this this 40 year anniversary poster with a bunch of like the big acts that we've had throughout the past 40 years. Um, so that was a cool thing that we sold a bunch of. I really like the the artwork and the design they did on this. Um, that was like a Christmas specific poster that we were selling. Um, and then yeah, our MoFest stuff. Um, MoFest is usually a series um, that we put on with uh, uh, in partnership with some local breweries. I think I saw Judson on here. So shout out to Logboat. Um, but we uh, we do it. It usually spans the whole month of January and it's uh, it's all genre specific. So, you know, Friday at Rose will be Mo Reggae Fest and Blue Note, Friday at Blue Note will be Mo Blues Fest. And and we do only, uh, only acts from the state of Missouri. And it's pretty impressive each year, uh, the amount of talent that we get for these and, and just you know, the bands that come from Springfield, Kansas City, St. Louis, Columbia, obviously. Um, it's a really cool series that we put on for, I think this would have been our our sixth year um, doing it. But so anyways, we couldn't do that. Um, we thought that the, um, you know, we, we, we obviously were like, okay, well, some sort of live stream series or recorded series, again, would be the, the obvious answer. But, you know, we didn't want it to seem too much like the social distraction thing that we had done. Um, so we, uh, we did like a, a highlight of a different local act or a different Missouri act every, every weekday um, for the month of January and posted, you know, links to live performances or recorded performances and um, their merch and their Venmos and PayPal's if you just wanted to send them money. Um, and so really tried to a keep the, keep the brand alive because we will 100% be doing this in, uh, in January of 2022 and also just, you know, to, uh, to, to you know, help out our local music scene, our, our state music scene as well. So I thought that was a, a cool little pivot. Um, and then we spent a lot of time coming up with a plan to do shows out at Midway. Um, so our, our venue in Charleston, South Carolina came up with a series called Around the Bend and you can see the little pod set up that aerial view that they have in the bottom right corner there. Um, so we kind of, it was a successful model. They played out like eight shows last summer and fall there with like Marcus King band and uh, what else do they have Jason Isbell and some cool acts um, that, that they got out there. So anyways, myself, our, uh, our security team, our operations team, our talent buyer, I don't know, went out to Midway probably 50 times between November and January and tried to come up with this ops plan and branding around it and um, shopped it around to agents and everything. And we got it, got it approved by the city and principal, which was great for them to approve a, 2000 person plan in December when the pandemic was still raging. Um, and then our, our timing was just a little bit off of this. By the time we had everything, you know, nicely packaged up and Pat was ready to shop it around to, to agents. That was like January, February. And that's when all the agents were like, eh, if we're going to come through in June or July, I'll bet you things will be different. So everyone kind of pumped their brakes, but, uh, it wasn't in vain because now we have a, a deal with, uh, with the guys that own Midway out there and we will 100% be producing shows out there again. Um, hopefully when we, you know, are, don't have restrictions and which case we can do six, seven, 8,000 people out there. So just adds a, a larger venue to our portfolio now. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool and um, I'm just glad all of our hard work wasn't in vain. Um, so now it brings me to the future. Um, we weathered the storm. Woo! We see light at the end of the tunnel. We're almost there. We have shows confirmed. We that aren't for like a hundred people. Um, future is very promising right now. Um, but they're also kind of scary. Like every time we talk about going back to normal, it's just weird. It's like it's like all right, what do we have to do? And it's like oh wait, no, we don't. We, we just open the doors. We don't have to do anything. It's, you know, we're granted, granted we're taking it slow. Um, June, we're going to be back to general admission, but we're going to keep our capacity at like 400, uh, which for Rose Park uh, is less than half and for Blue Note, right about half. Um, and then not looking to do anything full cap again until July. Um, but anyways, yeah, it's like, it's, you know, undoing all the work that we've done and, uh, and going back to normal is just weird. It's, you know, something that we, the, the non-normal we got used to. So it's just kind of unwiring your brain 
um, to going back to what has really been muscle memory for so long. So it's good, but yeah, it's, it's weird. Um, and, and yeah, we learned a lot about each other, our, our departments, we all grew together. Um, I know for me with, uh, with our home base being in Madison and then, you know, kind of expanding our operations into other markets. Um, one thing I was worried about was just sort of us being kind of left on our own Island. Um, which is good to some certain degree. Sometimes I want to be on my own Island, but, uh, um, but that didn't happen. And honestly, I feel, I feel like we're more ingrained with like the company heartbeat than, than we've ever been before. And, and I think, you know, just knowing the way we all communicate and all the, you know, between zoom and Slack meetings and everything else that we've done, like all the tools that we have at our, at our disposal. Now it's like, we're going to be, we're going to be so much stronger with all of the people that we have making the decisions and, and, and coming up with ideas. And, um, and yeah, I think we're, we're just going to, we're going to come out, uh, better and stronger and faster and all the words that they say in that Daft Punk song. Um, so yeah, I'm excited for the future. Um, there will be some lasting effects from COVID. Obviously, you know, there's things like, I don't see any reason why we would ever get rid of sanitizing stations now. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're getting some new uh, POS equipment that's going to allow people to hopefully order from their phones, pay from their phones. Um, you know, some of that stuff that I think was probably the way of the, the future anyways, will we'll stick around. Um, from the artist side of things, I mean, uh, it's funny, so I hate if any of you, uh, if this crushes any of your hopes and dreams, but most bands absolutely hate doing meet and greets. And I think this is going to be a reason why bands never do meet and greets again, <laughs> because they don't want to shake hands and hug people and touch. We'll, we'll see. I'm sure some of them will stick around. Um, so yeah, there'll be some things that I just think are become, you know, a permanent fixture from the pandemic. Um, and then, yeah, our first big show, like I hinted at, we have, uh, we have Cody Jinx. It's going to be July 16th of Friday on ninth street. So, um, we have a date. We're going to have 3000 rowdy country fans drinking beer and fucking shit up on ninth street. It's going to be awesome. Um, I'm, I'm pretty scared for that one too, but we'll, we'll get it done. It'll be, it'll be a good one. Um, and then fall of 2021 is just, is stacked. I mean, our, our end of July, August, we have so many shows booked September and October are going to be absolutely nuts. Um, and it's just gonna, it's not going to stop. It's all going to spill into 2022. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. I, uh, I hope I, I didn't drone on and, and bore you all, but that's, uh, that's what I got. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. That was great. It was fun to hear about all the things. Um, Lauren, I did send you a question, but I'm happy to read it since it was my question, but I don't know how many of them you got. Oh, Lauren, I think you're on mute. Guys, thank you. Um, I just have a couple of questions that came in. So send me those if you have them. But Sarah, if you want to ask your own question, you can. I'm happy to read it. But if you want to ask it too, you can. <laughs> I'm happy to ask. Um, yeah, Mike, you know, you were talking about just kind of the booking craziness and like every week you guys are having to change. Like I'm sure every everyone in here, we've, re we've gone through that with our own companies and our situations and our day-to-day -day life, schools, craziness. Everything was changing every week. We had to pivot a lot. Um, how were you guys kind of coming up with those ideas in that? Like, were you guys doing like Zoom room deliberations? Were you guys like having, like, was there like an organizational system that you guys were using? Like, what were the types of tools and like, how did you guys kind of change and pivot so well together as a team? Um, yeah, that's a great question. At first there was no rules or regulations. It was chaos. We were all just like firing emails out and ideas and texting each other and calling each other. And again, especially as like, you know, either news was changing or people were finding other resources. I mean, people were sending me podcast links to listen to this stuff. And like, there's just, there's so much, so much information and media to consume related to it. So at first it was just, yeah, it was total anarchy. From there, we kind of, uh, narrowed our focus. We, we created sort of, uh, I don't know, I guess you could call them committees where it would be, you know, a venue operator, um, somebody from the tech side of things, a marketer, um, sort of like one representative from each department to help sort of guide the decision making process. Um, and then, yeah, generally speaking, those would be either weekly or biweekly meetings. Um, and then we would create dedicated channels on Slack to, you know, venue reopening or, or sanitation protocols and try to keep all of our information 
at least organized um, so you're not just jumping into a thread, you know, 10 messages yeah. late and you're already on a different topic. Um, so yeah, we, we ended up finding a way to sort of organize all that. Um, but it, it took a minute. It was, it was chaotic for a while. You, you talked a little bit about, uh, the lasting effects of COVID. And I think these are questions that we're having across lots of different industries. Um, and even in my own industry, which is the education business the but fors of covid so what ha what or can you just speak a little bit about um other types of lasting effects that wouldn't have come about had it not been for covid whether that's group dynamics or things that you know not just the technical side but what's definitely sticking around that couldn't have existed before covid um that one's kind of tough. I mean, I think, you know, I know you said not technical side of things, but like, I don't think we would have, we would have upgraded like our bar technology without this, you know, it wasn't, it was working fine before. Um, I think, uh, I think the idea of like pods, people surprisingly, you know, it was like kind of 50, 50, some people hated it. Some people loved it. Um, so I have heard like sort of just like murmuring throughout the industry of like some big outdoor shows or like amphitheaters potentially offering something like that where like you know you would normally have a big lawn and you can be tripped on by every drunk person in, in the room and and now you do actually get your own section even though it's not like a reserved seat so I think we'll see some of that sticking around um you know uh um it's, it's it is kind of an abstract question I think that's the best answer I have right now um so sorry, but yeah. yeah. Will you continue, you think, to do the interdisciplinary planning? Like, will you continue to include yeah. security and bar and all the people on your decision-making teams? Totally. I mean, it, we quickly realized that, like, you know, even though we've all been doing this for a long time, I actually, next month will be my 10-year anniversary with the Blue Note, mm -hmm. but we quickly realized that, like, you know, even though we might be experts in our field, like, it's, we're so much better with all of the other experts in our field and, and yeah, just like having somebody with a, with a different perspective, you know, I might be hyper-focused on this one thing that I think is going to be an issue or um, cause us, you know, strife or something. And then, and then, you know, marketing or somebody else comes at it from a different perspective. And it's like, no, 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 man, like that's, that's not that big of an issue. Do it like this. I'm like, oh yeah, I didn't even think about that. So yeah, I, I don't think we'll ever um, go away from that, especially with some of these, like, like I said, sort of committees that we formed, um, yeah, we just like bonded over it. So I, I don't think we would internally, I don't think we would have let it, let it go away, even if somebody wanted it to go away. Uh, my question, Mike, is when we do launch in-person events, do you want to be our first venue to host an in-person yeah, event? Absolutely. Was, yeah, 100%. We, um, our first event was like over a year ago and we had about a hundred people. And so it's just like virtual events are just, we're so happy that you're here. It's just not as cool as it would be to see you in person and to shake your hand and like be together. Yeah. So we, Sarah and I were talking about that and said, do you think that he would let us like host an event at the Blue Note at eight o'clock in the morning on a Friday? <laughs> so totally. I can, I can say with almost a hundred percent certainty, we will have nothing booked at 8 a.m. on a Friday. <laughs> That's what I figured. <laughs> Mike, I don't have a question. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to the team at Blue Note and Rose for keeping our venues safe during this year. The Ro Rose and Music or and the Blue Note are like my two favorite places in this town. So we need them. And thank you so much. Yeah, you're very welcome. Yeah, thank you so much, Mike. Relay yeah. that to your team too. Well, I will. I wanted to say thank you to Mike for sharing this because um, we just, I just finished um, our, up our true false outside and it was really nice to hear about the background workings of another operation that had to do that. And it was just, it was very like validating in the experience of like this chaotic, like back and forth where like you'd spend three weeks planning something and then the health department's just like, no, you can't do that. And then you have to go back and replan the whole thing and, you know, dealing with sponsors and vendors and everything like that it felt very, very chaotic, but I'm, I'm glad to know I wasn't alone in that chaos. Not at all. You gotta have thick skin. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Looks like there's one more question. Is any of the special quarantine merch still available to buy? Yeah, we do have the we have the t-shirts. Oh, actually, that's another thing. That I don't think bandanas are gonna, gonna go away. Those are pretty rad, and like they don't say anything specific to COVID on them. So like I think we're gonna keep reprinting those. But yes, the quarantine tour t-shirts I do still have available. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Um, well, if no one else has any other questions, um, Mike, thanks so much for being here um, and, and joining us. Um, it's just, yeah, just great to have you and to know that I'm not a Columbia or Missouri native. I've been here about five years. And so I've spent a lot of my time at both of those venues with, with Sarah and with Kayla and, and other folks um, here. And so I'm excited to get, get back out there. Um, in the meantime, we'll be in touch for sure whenever in-person events do launch again, but um, thanks everyone for being here. We'll have information about next month's event, um, who our speaker's going to be and what the theme is soon, but otherwise y'all have a good Friday. It's, you know, hopefully the sun comes out today, but good to see you and have a good weekend. Bye everybody.